Grace. I appreciate it. And good evening, everybody. Welcome to midweek and welcome to our lesson, our study time. And uh, I really appreciate Reese uh, having that time to pray and to have a moment of silence. Of course, this is a very, uh, some pretty horrific things happening in our world. And we need to keep praying because, uh, you know, obviously lots of people are suffering on both sides of this conflict. And this conflict is, you know, escalating and could get even um, much bigger. So we've just got to pray for peace. You know, this seems to always be the classic prayer, peace in the Middle East. And, um, you know, it's ironic, that, of course, that um, the place where God has done so many great things has always been like one of the hot spots of the globe, always, you know, for thousands of years. And, of course, Satan's not going to leave it at peace and Satan's not going to leave them alone. So let's keep them in our prayers throughout the week and pray that things would calm, things would go back to, a, would go to a good place, you know. And I know this conflict is not sudden. It's been it's been around for a very long time. Really, you know, biblically it talks about all the way back to the sons of Abraham uh, having conflict. But um, so tonight I want to do a, a lesson. Uh, really, I want to start a series. Let me put it up on the screen. And it's a series on on uh just our spiritual journey to and I'm calling it help for the journey just practices and things we can do to be healthy strong uh Christians to be to walk with God and and really just thrive spiritually in our lives so tonight's a practice I just taught this at the retreat that we had with the MLC which is the ministry leadership Council um, for the Los Angeles Church. We we actually went away and spent uh, four days with God. Uh, you know, in a in a place far away from everything. The elders were able to come out. Many of the elders were able to come Saturday and Sunday. It was really a very powerful time. And one of the lessons I did, I realized, I thought, you know, this would just be good for all of us as Christians. And the lessons on discernment, which is one of the key things we have to learn in our spiritual journey, right? So uh, the series, I'm going to be going through a lot of spiritual discipline, just things that help us grow, things that help us in our journey. You know, uh, uh, we're all on our journey. It's not just those who left the church. They're on their journey. All of us are on a journey, right? All of us are, are growing and learning. And one of the skills that we have to develop is to be able to know God's will, to be able to recognize it, right? That's called discernment. Um, we actually, in the group, we read a book called Strengthening the Soul of Our Leadership, which I've actually, uh, we're reading with the elders and the, and the evangelists in our region as well. We've been reading it for a while. And a, and a quote in there, it says, at the heart of spiritual leadership is discernment. The capacity, and this is the definition, the capacity to recognize and respond to God's will, both personally and in community. It requires moving beyond our reliance on cognition and hard work to a place of deep listening and response to the Spirit of God within us and among us. So I love this definition because this is really what discernment is. It's really recognizing and understanding and responding to God's will. Because generally we know that Anytime you do God's will, it's just going to be better, right? It's going to go, life's going to be better. Everything's going to be better. And, and of course, as disciples, that's what we want, right? We want God's will to be done. So how does this apply in a practical life? It's, it's, it's learning how to recognize, how do I know God's will? I mean, there's so many different options in life. There's so many things going on. How do I know God's will for me? And, and we're not talking about doctrine. We're not talking about how we do church or necessarily, you know, although sometimes those are issues of discernment. And that's the very reason why the elders and evangelists spent time talking about discernment, making sure that God is leading our church. But all of us as disciples have to constantly, or not constantly, but frequently try to determine, try to figure out what is God's will for my life? You know, especially when we have big, decisions coming up, you know, decisions about life, about our faith, about our relationships, about our money, about our time, about our talents. And it's it's incredibly important. These are like the most valuable things that we have. 
it's incredibly important that we're doing God's will with them. And it's, you know, just generally, it's always better to do things God's will with God's will, right? In Romans 12, too, there's a scripture, he talks about discernment. Paul's writing to the Christians in Rome, and he says, do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern the will of God, what is good, pleasing, and acceptable, and mature. Okay, so and this is a direct translation from the Greek. The NIV is a little bit different, but I like this one because um, this is such a close translation to the original language. And, you know, and he starts out saying, don't be like the world. Don't think like the world. Don't be like the world. Don't do things the world does. But allow yourself to be transformed. Allow God to renew your mind, to, 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 to help you think godly, to help you think correctly, to help you think according to the truth and what is right and what is best. He says, so that you can discern the will of God, so that you can you can get it, right? You can capture it, you can understand it, and you can see God's will. What it and and and, and I love how he describes God's will: what is good, pleasing, and acceptable and mature, right? Or or I think the NIV says perfect will, right? It's 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 making the best decisions you can make. It's recognizing the options and, ma and making decisions that are really best for your life. Um, there's uh, in, in the same book that we were all reading, uh, Ruth Haley Barton is the author of the book. She says, discernment presents unique challenge in Western culture because it requires uh, it requires uh, us to move beyond our reliance on cognition and intellectual hard work to a place of deep listening and response to the spirit of God within us and among us. You know, she, she notes the challenge that we all have that, that we tend to want to think about everything, have intellectual reasons and just it all to make sense. But discernment really requires us being able to listen to the spirit of God to be good listeners, to be, to be able to be in tune with the Spirit of God. And that's not about information. That's not about, um, well, what she says, cognition and intellectual hard work. It's not about logic. It's really a spiritual act where you're just learn to listen to God and learn to allow Him to lead us through the decisions we got to make. And so sometimes it can, some of us that are more, uh, rationally based or scientifically based or logically based, we have a harder time with this, with things like this, listening to the Spirit of God. How do I know it's the Spirit of God? Well, we're going to talk about that. You know, how do you know when something is the Spirit of God? In Romans 8, 6, it says, the NIV it's, records that the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. In other words, how we think, in the you know, which is how we make our decisions, right? If it's governed by the flesh, what does he mean by the flesh? It means like what we feel, what we think. If it's just by our own emotions and our own thoughts and our own rationality, it ultimately leads to death. But a mind governed by the spirit leads to life and peace. Or as Muncie translates it, to set the mind on the flesh leads to death. But to set the mind on the spirit brings life and peace. And of course, when, when the Bible talks about life, it's the good life, the life that everybody wants, right? Where you're enjoying your life, you're happy in your life, you're safe in your life, you're living a life of shalom, right? With peace. That's the life he's talking about. But what he says is that requires us to set our minds on the spirit. And that's a practice. That's a spiritual discipline. And that's why it's in this category of spiritual disciplines. Of how do you set your mind on the Holy Spirit? How do you plug into the Holy Spirit? And it's incredibly important. When God was forming his nation, the holy nation, the, the people of God, he told them, choose wise and discerning and experienced men from your tribes, and I will appoint them as your heads. In other words, it was important that they that they chose leaders that were discerning. In other words, they were looking for God's will and they knew how to recognize God's will. See, because 
if what if we do God's will, it's bound to end up becoming great. It's whatever we choose, if it's God's will, it's going to be the best, right? And so he said, make sure that you choose wise and discerning and experienced men to be your leaders, basically, that they have to be men who know how to practice discernment or how to discern. But not just the leaders. He says, see, I taught you the statutes and the ordinances just as the Lord commanded. Therefore, observe them. When you enter the land you are about to possess, observe, observe them carefully, because this will show your wisdom and discernment in the eyes of the people who will listen to all these decrees. Then they'll say, surely this great nation is a wise and discerning people. For what great nation has a God so near like the Lord our God whenever we call on him? And I love this because he's saying basically when you practice discernment, everybody's going to see that you are the people who walk with God. You are the people who live out God's will. And, 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 you know, and he's holding that up, said this is who we need to be, and everybody will praise God because of because of it. They'll see, they'll say, surely this great nation is wise and discerning, a wise and discerning people. And that's really what people should be able to say about the church. These are the people who follow God. These are the people who live God's way. These are the people who carry out God's will. And 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 that makes us the light of the world to be able to have an impact on the whole world. So I want to give some keys of discernment, like how do you figure out God's will? You know, and obviously, again, we're not talking about what is, what you know, we're not talking about things we can just necessarily look up in Scripture, right? If we look up Scripture, you know, can, you know, uh, how should I, you know, can I sin? Can I not sin? How do I get baptized? Or or how do I get my sins forgiven? Those are clear. They don't require a lot of sermon because they're pretty plain and 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 clear in scripture. But what about my life decisions? That's what we're talking about. Big decisions in my life. So you start out with always a good place to start. If I got to make a big decision in my life, I have to clarify my goal. What is my goal in this decision? Is it how do I make the most money? How do I, how do I, you know, buy a house? How do I do this? How do I do that? Um, what do I feel? What do I want? What do people want? And those are the natural things that we think of, in a sense, what our flesh wants, right? Our flesh desires things. But a good way to look at it is really what does God want? What is God's will? Jesus said, This is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. And so Jesus basically is. is this was a training prayer. This was a way to think, a way to approach things, a way to live our lives is always seeking God's will. So it's not, what do I want? You know, what do I want to do? What? Do, I mean, those are important. I'm not saying those things aren't important. It's important to recognize those things. But ultimately, we know that if we do God's will, it's going to be what's best. It's going to be what's best for my life for my family's life, for my children's life, for, you know, for everyone around me. That's what's best. When we think about in the church, what are we going to do in the church? It's not what, what does Robert Carrillo want to do, or what does Michelle, or what Reese, or, or what does Casey or Michelle want to do? It's what is God's will? And that's really important, because if, 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 we're, if our minds are on the flesh, if our minds are, are set on what we want, well, everybody's going to want different things, right? Everybody's going to have different opinions and different views, and we'll never get unified. But if we all set our heart on God's will, even in my decision making, even in like I remember, I remember um, when when uh, Michelle and I went to Mexico to plant the church, and we were always talking about planting churches all over South America and all over Latin America because in our fellowship, the first. First two churches planted were Mexico City and, and Buenos Aires. And so I had all these dreams of going to South America, going to Colombia, going to Ecuador. And, and I was so excited about that. And then we got asked to please move to Miami and start a church. And my heart was broken. I was like, oh, man, I don't want to go back to the United States. That's like going backwards. I want to be a missionary and I want to go do this and and go do that, you know, and then I went to Miami, I loved it, I had a great time, 
And then I, I wanted to build a church there that reached thousands. And then we were asked to go take over Puerto Rico. And I was like, that's not my dream. I, I love Miami. I had such a great time there. And what I've learned along the way is it's, it's really not my will. It's God's will. That's always what's best. And I've learned that my goal or my dream or my passion should not be for something I come up with. It really should be for God. And I think that's that's really important. Like sometimes we get caught up in our own vision of what's supposed to happen, how the church should be, or, or you know, well, I wanted this ministry, you know, and I loved it when we did this, when we were out in the East or downtown or the West or the beach, or, or when we were all together, or when we were each in our own, these, these visions are great. And there's nothing wrong with those visions. But always we have to remember, it's about God's will, not my will. And ultimately, whatever God wills, that's what's going to be best for not just for me, but for everybody, right? There's a quote, um, God's will is the best thing that could happen to us under any circumstances. So I, I have dreams and I have I have ideas and I have things that I wish would happen, but I'm able to surrender those to God because I know that what is most important is God's will being done, whether it's my job, whether it's my future, whether it's my family, whether it's my marriage, whether it's my kids. Yeah, it's important to recognize what's on my heart and what's in my mind and what my vision is. But even more importantly is to ask God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And to actually be humble enough to recognize that that's what's going to be best for my life. There's, there's no better plan than God's plan for your life. That is the best plan. That's the plan that will make you happy, will make you confident, that will make you content, that will that will fulfill your needs. And, 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 if, and if anything, when we don't reach that happiness or that contentment or our needs aren't being met, it's usually because we're chasing something else instead of God's will, instead of his plan. So discernment is a lot to do. It starts out always just recognizing what is God's will. It also means turning to the Lord. And this is a key of discernment, you know, asking God for wisdom, facing God. And of course, when we clarify our goal and ask God's will to be done, that we, we in a sense, in our hearts are turning to him, right? Um, there's that word that we've studied in the past in our in our ministry, the word shuv in Hebrew, which literally means to turn and face God, right? Turn to God. And, and that's that is key for discernment, right? We ask God for wisdom, we be still, we be silent, and we listen carefully to God. Nothing worse than somebody asking you a question and then they walk away. What do you feel like? Well, they didn't really want the answer, right? They didn't really want to know what you thought. I think we do that with God sometimes. We ask God and then we leave and we do what we were going to do anyways. It was like we just went through the motion of asking him, but we weren't really listening. We weren't really asking and expecting an answer, right? James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you, right? I mean, God wants us to ask him. I like it in the, in the Living Bible. It says, if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him, and he will gladly tell you, for he is always ready to give a bountiful supply of wisdom to all who ask him. He will not resent it. I love that. It's, it's pretty straight up. You know, but it, listen, if you want to know what God wants you to do, just ask him, all right? And and I would add to I would add that we just got to make sure we listen, right? That we stay there, we listen to God, and and He says He'll 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 give us answers. He'll show us the way. But a lot of times, what's really key is we got to be silent. You know, if somebody asks you a question and then they keep talking, you're gonna think they don't really want your answer. They just went through the motion of it, right? We have to be silent. Uh, I love this Psalm four four: Tremble and do not sin when you are on your bed. Search your hearts and be silent. And sometimes, and this is what I'm talking about, the it's not the rational cognitive, the way it was said in the quote, approach to finding information. This is a spiritual way to be quiet, to be silent, and to just listen. What does God putting on my heart? What is he putting on my mind? 
What is he putting in my mind? God doesn't have to write it on the wall. He doesn't have to announce it with a trumpet. God is able to put thoughts directly into your mind, to put feelings right on your heart. He's able to work directly with us to help us understand things. You know, Moses saw the burning bush because he was out being silent in solitude with with nothing but sheep, you know, and he was able to see the the fire of the burning bush. Um, Many, many times, it's not until we are silent that we hear God's voice. Elijah went to, to Mount, Mount Horeb, and there he heard in the gentle whisper. It was not in the wind. It was not in the fire. It was not in the earthquake. It was a gentle whisper, right? And and sometimes that's how it is. Even, even Peter, when he guessed that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Peter, because nobody told you this. The Lord showed you this. But and and what what was so blessed about him was that he was paying attention. At least that time he blew it a lot, but that time he was paying attention. We got to pay attention, right? We got to listen. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have, will be taken away from them. Wow! So how we interact with God and what happens in our life, in large part, depends on us listening to Him. And really being careful how we listen, that we're giving him our attention, that we're considering carefully what what is God's will? What does he want me to do? Praying about it, listening to this, and, and being still for him to put, to show us things, to put things on our hearts, to open our minds to things. On the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize Jesus, remember? And and then all of a sudden, Jesus opens their minds. Sometimes Jesus opens our minds and shows us things. Oh, I get it, right? But you've got to be asking. You've got to be searching. You've got to be still. And you've got to be listening so that God can put things in your heart or in your mind, right? And we live in an incredibly distracted world so much going on. Our phones are nonstop trying to get our attention. People pay big money just to grab your attention, right? They're constantly sending things. There's so much happening all around us all the time. There's so many things distract us. So it's really counterculture, countercultural to be a Christian. It's going the opposite direction of the world to slow down, to stop to listen, to think about, to to meditate on, to be still so that God can put thoughts in our minds, feelings on our heart. Uh, There's an old quote, "When when the mouth is silent, the soul speaks, right? When we are silent, the soul, our souls speak, and we can hear our souls, we can feel our souls. That's when you know, and you know, when you when you feel that hunger or that thirst for God, that's your that's your soul communicating with you. And but most of the time, honestly, we're too busy running around doing too much, and we don't even notice how our souls are doing. I love this analogy in in uh, in one of Ruth Haley Barton's books. She talks about how you know that you get it's like getting a jar and dipping it in the river, and it's all full of mud and swirling and everything. But if you let it sit. All the mud slowly settles down and the water becomes clear. And that's how it can be for us when we're trying to make a big decision. And we got all kinds of emotions and thoughts swirling around in our head or in our heart. We just have to be still. Think about God and be quiet and listen and let our minds be clear. Let our minds get clear. Um, Some other keys of discernment. And these are, these are to help us figure it out, right? When we got these big decisions of life or faith or relationships or money or time or careers or, or what I'm going to do, you know, uh, I mean, anytime we have these big decisions, one of them is just be self-aware, be self-aware. You know, our, it's important to be self-aware so we know, like, what is my tendency? What do I tend to do? Do I tend to play it safe? Do I tend to be reckless? Do I tend to be flippant? Do I tend to be to overdo it? What are my temptations? 
You know, this is why confession is really important, that we are confessing our sins to one to another, that I, you know, I, I consider it just a daily practice to confess my sins to God because it keeps my feet on the ground. It helps me remember who I really am, not get deceived about myself, not get prideful, not get arrogant, not become independent of God, but just talking about my weaknesses with God, talking about my struggles with God, apologizing to God when I mess up. Those things are just really good for keeping me clear-minded and self-aware. I know who I am. I know who I'm not. You know, If I don't do that, I get more prideful. I get more egotistical. I get more arrogant. I get more judgmental. And, and those are all bad. I get more self-righteous. So just even confessing my sins, Pray, you know, sharing with with God, but even you know, apologizing if I offend or hurt Michelle or or the girls in the house or or a brother or whatever. These all these things help me to be self aware, right? And it's important to be aware. What are my fears, especially when I have to make a big decision? What's my worst fear? And that'll reveal a lot because a lot of times we make decisions based on fear. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, talk to that brother. Why? Because we're afraid it's going to go bad. Even though the Bible says, you know, if your brother sins against you, talk to him, we won't do it because we're afraid, you know, and it's good to just recognize that fear or recognize hurts. You know, when we get hurt, what do we do? We pull back, right? And we don't want to get hurt anymore. So we pull back and we don't want to have friends or we don't want to get open or be vulnerable. And, and even though, you know, we know that it's going to hurt us. It's going to end up hurting our whole lives if we live according to our hurts. And you can't get healed of our hurts if we don't get real about our hurts, if we're not aware of our of the things that are hurting us and affecting how we make decisions, affecting the decisions we make. It's important to know our biases. You know, some of us are more conservative. Some of us are more liberal. Some of us are more hard lines. Some of us are more liberal, you know, all about love and emotion. Others are all about truth and righteousness. Just know that, know that. So, so you know which way you will naturally lean when you got to make a big decision. Vanity is a big one. Sometimes we just, we want everybody to like us. We want everybody to think we're awesome. And that's, and our decision is based way too much on what other people think because we want everybody to look up to us or think we're awesome or this. And we make decisions based on that instead of based on God's will. And the big one, the ego. I mean, always be aware of our ego. Um, I think when Jesus was talking about carry a cross, you know, uh, I think he was talking about our ego. Nail that ego to the cross, you know, our pride, our selfish ambition. You know, I want this. I want that. I you know, and 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 we don't listen to others, right? I think another key of discernment is just surrendered, just being surrendered. I trust you, God. I believe you, God. Whatever you want, what and and I believe that that if it's God's will, it will be best, even if it means I'm going to suffer, even if it means it's going to be hard times. That's radical surrendering. And it's important. Some of the some of the classic writers talk about discernment. In this one, they're talking about this. They call it freedom, the freedom to make a decision based on God, not based on your will. Because oftentimes our nature is my kingdom come, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven, instead of your kingdom come, your will be done. We have to surrender. Remember, Jesus told a little parable about this. If two kings are facing each other, wouldn't the one go to find and make terms of peace? Terms of peace is just a fancy way of saying surrender. Um, listening careful to others, carefully to others. This is important discernment because God speaks through spiritual people. So having good spiritual friends to talk to and 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 people that you believe are good at discernment. They're, they're, they listen to God. They think about God. They set their minds on the Spirit. Boy, those are valuable friends to have to get advice from. Now, of course, this is assuming you want God's will, right? If you want to just do your own thing, you're not going to want to talk to spiritual people. But if you really want, if you trust God, if we believe in God's promises, 
then we'll see what God wants. And that could be anything from what's my contribution to where am I going to move to, to what am I going to quit my job? Who am I going to get married to? Or am I going to live this life and I have no prospect for marriage or whatever, you know, any big decision, we want God's will to be done, right? And so having spiritual friends is incredibly important. And, and seek unity with the godly, like, what do godly people think about this? That's that's a great that's a great help in discernment. You know, just talking to several godly people, spiritual people that can help us. One of the things the Bible talks about is just practicing godliness, practicing, practicing, practicing. It says anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who, by constant use, have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. People who are just daily trying to be righteous, trying to be holy, trying to do the right thing are much quicker to notice if something's wrong or that that's a bad decision or that's not wise. And again, this is why it's good to have spiritual friends. Um, and But the truth is, the more we practice godliness, the more we can quickly recognize it. The person without spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. And this is, again, this is just kind of highlighting why is it so important to have spiritual friendships, to have spiritual people to talk to. And I don't mean, you know, it, that may or may not be your disciple. I'm, I don't know if everybody has disciples, but but ha but you everybody needs spiritual relationships. I can tell you this: nobody is going to be successful in their Christian life without friends. Nobody is going to make it to heaven by themselves. We all need spiritual friends that will help us, that will guide us along, that will give us, you know, keys for good discernment that we need, and and. And we all have friends that will give us worldly advice and, and tell us to do whatever we feel like doing. I mean, it's a very strong philosophy in our world. If it feels good, do it. If it makes you feel good or happy, then do it. Just, you know, that's almost like a virtue. You know, have the courage to do whatever makes you happy. No, have the greater courage to do God's will. And ultimately, that will make you happy. Actually, in reality, you'll end up being a happier person. And this is my prayer, Paul wrote, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best, may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. You know, this was Paul's prayer that we'd be good at discernment, that we'd be able to recognize God's will and carry it out and do whatever God wants to, because that's the best life. There's no better life. There's no better way to find joy, peace, patience, kindness, love, all the fruits of the Spirit. Those are all accessible to us if we do God's will. If we don't do God's will and we chase it ourselves, you know, love and joy and peace and contentment, these are illusions that people chase after by trying to make lots of money, by being famous, by being good looking, by having the right partner in life, by all this stuff. And they don't get it. They don't get it because it doesn't come that way. It comes from God and doing God's will. So, you know, the, the, the idea of just seeking out God's will, how do I know if he's talking to me? I just want to say one thing. We're going to wrap up here soon. But, you know, sometimes it's kind of hard to know people, and you'll hear people say, oh, the Spirit told me this, or the Spirit told me that, you know, and, and it can be really doubtful because it's like, really, really, the Spirit's talking to you? Dude, you were out getting high the other day, and now you're telling me the Spirit's talking to you? <laughs> or somebody who's, you know, who's clearly not living a spiritual life. And so, it, and, 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 and they totally believe that the Spirit told them something. So it is important to recognize what Spirit's talking to us, right? Um, 1 John 4, 1, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. You know, there's a lot of false teaching out there. There's a lot of false spirits out there, and that's important to recognize. We stop and listen. We have to be able to test those spirits and test the ideas that come. Here's some good little rules of discernment, good little tests. 
things to know. God's will is always in sync with Scripture. The Spirit of God will never tell you to do something to violate Scripture or that's different than Scripture. I mean, the, the Scripture came from the Spirit of God, right? So the, 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 the Spirit never contradicts itself. God's will always draws us toward unity. God pulls us together, right? Jesus' prayer was that we be one. God is always working towards unity. If we get if we get a message that we think we're supposed to do something to separate ourselves from God's people, I guarantee you that's not the Spirit. The Spirit wants to pull us together, keep us connected, make us one. God's will is always a manifestation of love. It's never out of anger. It's never. Out, it's not even out of fear. It's out of love. Everything God's will is always wrapped in love. Because why? Because God is love. So if it's something that's hateful or vengeful or even fearful, it's not going to be from God. Because God always pulls towards love. God's will is always good for your soul. And even though, even though sometimes God's will makes life harder, that's a fact. Sometimes, sometimes we suffer because we do God's will, and yet it will still be good for our soul. It's still which which will affect your whole life, which will affect every other part of your life, and that's always a good thing. And God's will is always what's best. Ultimately, it's always what's best. Sometimes, on the short run, it seems like oh, that's not going to be good for me. But in the long run, it always is. And these are just some nice rules to kind of go through in your mind when you're trying to make a decision. So, so you know, practicals, ask God, pray about it, sit in silence and solitude, listen, look to see what God is showing you, identify the issues that are involved, gather the data, the information, key points, uh, meet with spiritual friends. Um, these are called clearance committees in the Quaker community. I, I actually got to go through a clearance committee and I asked the input about my future. Um, have guides. In Acts 15, James was the guide of the major decision they had to make about whether Gentiles had to become Jews. Huge decision. And you get to see discernment played out in Acts 15. Identify the paths, which, okay, what are my options, you know? And consolation and desolation is like what feels right, what doesn't feel right, what goes with scripture, what doesn't go with scripture, what makes me feel closer to God, what doesn't make me feel closer to God, and then have the faith to implement it, implementation. So these are the practicals uh, for discerning, and we'll post this if you want to go back through. God's will is always what's best, and and so discernment is really important. And as we make decisions, you know, we're going to, we're, we're heading into the end of the year. You know, what are we going to do in the holidays? What are we going to do different next year? I mean, we're beginning the process on the staff with the elders of what's going to be our theme. What do we need to work on as a church? I'd ask your prayers because we need to discern these things. We want God's will to be done in Metro so that we are a shining light to the whole city of LA. So that's discernment. God bless you. Buen camino.